Well, hello there, everyone. Uh, this is former Flagstaff Mayor Coral Evans. I am here uh, tonight with former mayor, former mayor of Phoenix, Terry Goddard, also former um, Arizona Attorney General. Hello, Mr. Goddard. Dr. Evans, it's a pleasure to see you. It is absolutely my joy to have you on the Mayor's Community Policy Trust. Right before um, we went live, we were having the conversation about mayors. And I know that over the over the years, I've had the opportunity to talk to you numerous times, um, really about the concept of what it means to be a mayor. And I just really appreciate you being on our show today to talk about the concept of statesmanship. Happy to do that. And, and I think about the uh, mayordom as, as perhaps the best job in America. If you care about public policy, that's where things happen and that's where people get served. Uh, uh, other levels of government tend to be a little theoretical and, and uh, no disrespect, but I think when you have to fill potholes and you have to collect garbage and you have to do the things that actually matter to people in their day-to-day -day lives and where they know where to call if they've got a complaint, uh, you, you're on the front, front lines and that's what mayors and council people do. Mm -hmm. Well, Mayor, let's just kind of jump into this conversation. I know that I only have you for a short a short amount of time. And again, I appreciate your time being here. Um, let's talk about this concept of statesmanship and, and what exactly does that mean to you? Well, I think it's a it's a magnificent concept that usually is 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 in the abstract, I'm afraid. Um, the idea that you know what you're doing in governance and you do it well. I think that that sort of, at least in my my view, summarizes the the uh, uh, the the idea of a statesperson. Uh, but there's a uh, there's an aspect to it that I think is unwritten, and it's probably not part of the uh, certainly not part of the Webster's uh, uh, definition that you quote uh, in your piece. Um, it's it's about civility. It's about being able to understand the other person's point of view. And to respect that, you may not agree, but at least you can respect what they think, why, understand if you can why they think that way. And, and I think that's been missing in an awful lot of the discussions that we have in America today. You know, it's interesting, Mayor, that you mentioned civility, right? Um, and the ability to, to listen uh, to someone else's point of view and to accept the fact that you might not agree, right? Um, and so can we talk or can we just maybe talk a little bit about how do you how do you bring together policy um, for a group of people, right? For a city um, that, you know, you're talking to a lot of different people, um, some of whose ideas you agree with, some that you don't. But how do you craft that into a policy that works for that works for the community that you serve? What does that look like? Well, it, it, it obviously depends on the issue. So there, are, there you, you can go from fixing potholes uh, about which there's little debate usually uh, to uh, uh, long-term planning and zoning about which there's a lot. Uh, you know, what kind of community do you want to build in the, in the great future? Um, and I, I think that there, there are a couple of tricks, there are a couple of, of important aspects to this. Tricks is the wrong word, clearly, and game is the wrong word. So I'll try to leave both of those off the table. Um, but clearly one of them is to get as much input as you can. Uh, one of my things that I'm proudest of in the city of Phoenix when I had the opportunity to serve there was we really opened the doors. That, that was literally my slogan, to open the doors to city hall. And we brought in groups of folks who had never really had access to the governance process in Phoenix, as big a city as it had become uh, back in the uh, early 1980s, it was still ruled by a district elected council, excuse me, an at-large elected council. We changed that, we changed it to a district group, uh, which I thought was very important because in a city that size, running at large was just almost incomprehensible for most citizens. And when you book it up in eight districts, they had more of a chance to talk to their elected council person. Not guaranteed, but more of a chance. Yeah. Um, and we did a series of forums across the city that allowed folks to come in and, and have at it on any subject that they wanted, 
But it was interesting how quickly it boiled down to one or two really hot button uh, issues. And some of them we could solve. Some of them were relatively easy. The, the one that comes to mind uh, is left turn arrows. Uh, we were a city, believe it or not, and it wasn't a political statement. It was a matter of traffic engineering. Our traffic control people believed that left turn arrows were an abomination that they slowed the traffic at getting to the destination, that their only goal in life was to make sure that the through traffic went as fast as it possibly could. And uh, we joked for a little while that that meant that it, the only way to get anywhere in Phoenix was to turn right, uh, either politically or physically. And because you couldn't make a left turn, it would be worth your life to try to do that. And uh, we did a series of forums with the successor, the guy who came up with that policy, resigned the day I was elected. So I think maybe he saw something on the, on the, uh, on the, the horizon. His successor basically had the same point of view. And we did these, these series of district forums where we asked the city staff to come in and listen to what people had to say. And in the first one, the number one issue was why doesn't this city have left turn errors? And he gave a very eloquent response as to why it was just wrong for the management of traffic. And we weren't ever going to do that. And he got booed. And, and he was a sensitive man and a smart one. And so at the next session, he gave the same answer, but it was much more calculated. It was much more, well, here are the reasons and here's what we need to think about. And we'll, we'll tell me what intersection you're interested in and we'll do a study. They booed him again. So for the third session at a different council district, somebody asked the question. It was it was absolutely as as absolutely uh, predictable as as the sun rising in the in the sky. And um, at this point, he said, "Well, tell me which intersection you're interested in, and we'll 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 get an we'll get an arrow in, installed in that intersection." I didn't have to say a word. I didn't have to tell him that I thought the right answer was to put in. Uh, left turn arrows and that I thought we were idiots not to do that. I just let him listen to the people and he came to his own conclusions. So sometimes uh, g getting the, your ear to the ground can have some very positive results. So Mayor Goddard, when were you mayor of the city of Phoenix? Oh, it's ancient history now. I was elected in 1983. I went into office in 84 and I left office in 1990. 1990. Quite a and while ago. But it's amazing, as they say, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Many of the issues, I'm sure, are very similar to what you had to deal with in Flagstaff. And uh, the, uh, the, the whole set of how do you make sure that citizens have a chance to get their say, they don't, they don't always get their way, but they should have a chance to have their say. And I think that's a, that's a, a big distinction. Many citizen advocates feel, well, if I get involved, I should win. Well, it doesn't work quite that way but at least you need to hear their voices. Yeah, I think that that's a very good point. You know, definitely uh, sounds like um, the, the issues that you were tackling when you were mayor were also the same issues that I was tackling here in Flagstaff when I was mayor. And I would say that most mayors have been tackling since I guess the beginning of mayor mayorship. Um, mayorship. <laughs> good word. Yeah, it's like we're trying to come up with the word, but um, there is a sense. And, and uh, to me, it seems as if it's grown and maybe we can kind of talk about that. It seems that over the years, um, before there was a sense of we could have a conversation and talk about it and understand that it may or may not happen, or at least listen to the reasons why perhaps that particular um, proposal wasn't accepted. But it seems like um, more than ever now, um, you have groups that come up and they have an idea. And if their idea is not accepted, they're just mad, right? You know, well, they're just upset. And then they attack the process. They say, well, if I didn't get my way, there must be something corrupt going on. And, and then, they, uh, then they, became, uh, uh, they, they become uh, uh, critics of a process which m hopefully was not corrupt, that simply on the facts made a separate decision from the one that they were advocating. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the process because, you know, in the city of Flagstaff, there, um, there was a newspaper article about the fact that there are more open council seats than there are people running for council. And many people have said that the process needs to change. And it's because people had to get so high a level of signatures 
But there's two people that managed to get the signatures needed to get on the ballot. And but there's this thing about we need to change the process. And a couple of people have asked me and I'm like, do we need to change the process? Or perhaps the people who did not get on the ballot didn't get enough signatures. Maybe they started too late. Or maybe they just didn't get enough signatures because people didn't sign, didn't sign, right? And so is it really the process that is that we need to change? Or do we need to look at who was running, when they pulled paperwork, you know, how long it was taken to gather signatures? There's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes into it. Well, there really is. And I think in a case like that, I, I spend a lot of my life, it seems like, trying to get signatures for, for initiative petitions and for candidates. Um, and, and the important thing in that process is that everybody knows the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what the deadlines are. You know how, uh, how you prepare for elected office. And getting signatures is a pretty good test. It's not the final test, but I think it's a way in our democracy that you can at least say that my fellow citizens believe in me enough that they'd like to see my name on the ballot. Uh, that's not a casual undertaking. That's not something that ought to be done just because you woke up one morning and decided this was going to be good for you. Uh, you know, it needs to be a great effort. And, and getting the signatures, uh, I, 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 I defend that process. I think it's one that makes a lot of sense. And to throw out the process just because not enough people took the time to work with it, uh, I think is a pretty invalid, invalid reason. Um, and, and I'm, I'm sad to hear. And, and now, of course, people, I guess, have to write on to the ballot, which is a whole lot more difficult than the initial process of getting a petition. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, they hopefully they will because you need those candidates and flag staff. But it's uh, I've generally found the candidate petition is not the threshold uh, that that deters people who really believe they can serve and have a constituency ready to help them. Best example I can think of right now is here in Maricopa County. Uh, suddenly we had the resignation of the county attorney. And because it was relatively short before the deadline, the April 4th deadline for getting a petition signed, uh, people really scrambled. And some of them went out and paid a lot of money to get those signatures. One candidate that I happen to, to uh, think very highly of uh, got all of her signatures in 24 hours online. And that's because she had a lot of friends who were dedicated to getting her in office. And I think it's a pretty good proof that she's a viable candidate. Thank you for that. Um, because I know a couple of people asked me and I was like, you know, the first step in being vetted is the signature process. You know, as somebody who's also had to go out and chase down a lot of signatures over the years, I was like, that's the first step. And I'm not necessarily sure that the issue is the process as it is, like you said, the timeliness, you know, who and those types of things. What, let's talk about activism for a little bit and, and what that means to you and whether or not you see a difference between activism and, and statesmanship. And if so, what might that look like? That's a, that's a great question. That's a uh, lot, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there. And you and I both come from an activist uh, beginning. I was... Uh, I was an advocate for bringing the district system to the city of Phoenix. Uh, and that's probably why I was fairly well known when I ran for mayor. Uh, it was a one issue uh, proposition and, and that issue had been on the ballot the year before and we won, we won fairly. It was a very tight election and it was against substantial opposition. So uh, having succeeded on that, I proceeded to run for for mayor, and I think a lot of people thought I was a one-issue candidate, that all I cared about was getting the district system started and uh, really hadn't spent any time working on other aspects about city governance. Um, I actually had, but that was not well known, and, and the paper went after me for being a one-issue, a one-trick pony, if you will. Um, and I had to learn a lot. I, I think there's no question that city governance is very complicated, that there's a lot that to be depend on good staff to get accomplished. And the elected officials can't do it all or know it all, but they really need to know a lot. And that education process is something that I think the activists tend to underestimate. I think they, they come from one particular issue that they know terrifically well, but then they, give short shrift to all the other things that a city government does. And 
the good ones learn quickly. They learn on the job and they realize how complicated it can be. And I think turn into terrific councilmen and mayors. Um, but sometimes they end up being just that one trick pony that, that uh, cares about one particular thing. And then I think lets their constituents down because mm -hmm. you're in one of just a few seats, representative seats on a council. And if you can't speak knowledgeably about the budget or about transportation or about uh, a wide variety, crime and, and, and housing, uh, you're, you're not going to get the job done if the only reason you got there was because you were opposed to a particular project or you were opposed to a particular freeway. Um, and, and that, I think at that point, it becomes up to the followers to make a strong and clear eyed decision is the person that we're promoting just there to attack one particular issue. Or do they have the breadth and the knowledge or the potential to have the knowledge to, to serve in all the different capacities that a council person or mayor is asked to serve in? You know, thank you so much for, you know, really speaking to that, because I do think, you know, you, know, you mentioned the fact that we came in from activist backgrounds. Um, and um, I think before we came on the show, I was talking to you about, you know, what I learned over my first four years and then an additional four years on council um, before I even ran for mayor. You know, I came in because of one particular issue. Um, and it was interesting because before I was sworn in, that issue was actually solved, right? The council decided on that issue. But you are sworn into a four-year seat. And so I quickly had to understand that, hey, there's the city budget. How does that impact the neighborhoods? You know, there's police, there's fire, there's a, there's a public, like public safety, there's transportation, there's water issues, there's environmental issues. There's just a whole host of other things, right? And um, I remember as mayor, um, I had a council member say at the dais that they were elected for one issue. And that was the only thing that they cared about. And I was like, wow, because that issue will be over with in a couple of weeks and you are still here for four years. So what else are we gonna do? But it seems like we as people enjoy the one issue candidates. Well, I think we're, uh, especially if this is an issue that, that uh, is close to your heart, uh, that is important to your neighborhood, for example, um, it's easy to think that what I need to do is to elect somebody to council who can be an ad advocate on that specific issue. And, and I'm, I'm intrigued by your, uh, your hypothetical there. If you're elected on one issue and that issue solved, maybe you should resign uh, if you really don't care about the rest of the job uh, and let somebody who does care take their position. But I'm assuming that's not gonna happen. Uh, it, it, it is not very often. I've actually, I'm on a board right now which is a water board. And we had some people run for it on a no tax pledge. That was all they cared about. And uh, one of the people that was elected, after she actually learned what it was the board did, she did resign because she said, well, I, I realize now that this is a very complicated issue and, and you have to deal with a lot of management of the water system. And that's not what I thought you did. I'm just here on the tax issue. And so I'm gonna vote no on higher taxes and then I'm gonna leave. And so there was an honesty about that that I thought was refreshing. Um, but in most cases, people uh, hopefully undertake a very fast learning process. And that's the, the best people that I've dealt with that may have started as a single issue person uh, have have tended to, to become much broader in their uh, exposure to everything else. And as you say, you, you could go on, if, if you're a neighborhood advocate, for example, and your neighborhood advocacy caused you to be opposed to a particular roadway or a particular freeway, um, that's just one issue that affects your neighborhood. And later on, the city budget, the quality of the library, the ability to coordinate with the schools, all of those become neighborhood issues too. And, and if you're worth your salt, I think you end up broadening your, your, uh, your knowledge base and what you're active about from just a single issue to much more. The people who can't do that, frankly, don't belong in elected government because they're not serving their constituents well. 
And so this is something that, you know, we as constituents, I say we because, you know, we vote um, and also people that are listening to, you know, this podcast really need to, I think, take take to heart. Um, you know, as we move into elections, as we look at different things, right? Um, I think we need to take in the heart and really push the candidates to to um, speak more about, like, this is your passion and this is what you're really good at and this is what you know. Can we hear now what are some ways that you look at um, growing your knowledge base, um, accessing additional information? How does, like, maybe if we're really excited about sustainability, how does um, transportation fit into that? How does parks and recreation fit into that? How does economic development, jobs, and public safety fit into um, your knowledge skill set? If you don't have it, how would you get it? Because really, it's all those things working together. Absolutely, Mayor. The the it seems to me there are two critical roles in a democracy. One is the leader, and you need quality leadership and knowledgeable leadership. The other one, however, is the followers. And and follower is a 24-hour job, too. Uh, it seems to me if you are somebody who's going to give your vote to a leader that you believe in, uh, you need to hold them accountable. And I think you put it very well that, that there there are things beyond that single issue that you may care about right now that... Uh, a good follower has to be concerned about as well. And so I think we tend as voters and we're all voters and we're all both leaders and followers, depending on which particular issue we're, we're talking about. Um, we, we need to exercise our followership uh, just as much as a leader has to exercise their leadership. And, and it seems to me responsible followers are in somewhat short supply these days. I like the way you put that, um, that followership is a 24 hour day job too. Right. And I think that that's pretty important. And I do think that, um, sometimes we forget that, you know, sometimes you have a constituent group helps someone to get into office and then they're like, okay, the problem solved. Um, yeah, we're done. You know, we're, we're over here and it comes down to, you actually need four votes to move something forward. Right or there's an issue with the budget, or it's going to take five years to move that particular project forward because that's just kind of how it goes. And people end up getting really super disappointed really quickly because it didn't happen like overnight. And you you really, um, it takes it takes time sometimes. Like some of this stuff didn't happen instantly. You know, it didn't just get broke um, and you can't just necessarily quickly fix it. Or there's more di- dynamics to it. Let, let, Mary, let me give you a, a, a little bit of an example. Um, you know, I'm kind of an impatient person, and I was an advocate as mayor for our downtown and for historic preservation and for uh, making Phoenix a 24-hour city. Those, those were the kind of visions that I had, and I used to lecture uh, people who came in for zoning because I thought, for instance, if they were in the downtown area, they were under-requesting. They should want more density. They should want more... Uh, individual units than they were coming up for and and they, they really gave me funny looks because they said you know we you know I'm, I'm doing what i think is right what the the economy will justify and and i got very uh let's say short-tempered uh with some of them i uh, probably shouldn't have because they were doing what they thought was the economic needs of the time and now 30 years later the apartment buildings and the new developments that i wanted to have right now are beginning to happen. And I think to some degree, the, the groundwork that we laid back in the 80s was important to being able to, to have these projects come forward now. But the idea that it would take 30 years for my ideas to actually happen would have been very depressing to me at the time. And and I still find astonishing that it, it the governmental processes grind very fine and they do take time. And I, I'm continuously surprised by that. Yeah, you know, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, okay, at least it didn't take 30 years for some of the stuff, right? <laughs> because I was talking to somebody the other day about affordable housing. And they were like, you guys did absolutely nothing. And I was like, actually, I go, I pointed to like this dirt lot. I was like, you see that? That's being dug up. They're like, yeah, I go, we voted on that five years ago. 
<laughs> you know, I'm like, literally, we voted on that five years ago. The Rio de Flag project um, and Flagstaff is another um, thing. It's been going on for 20 years, right? You know, and it's so close, but it's it's almost there. But I'm sure that the mayors that started that years ago also didn't think it was going to take 20 years. But I bet you they're pretty happy to see how close we are. Um, but people don't necessarily realize that, right? And then when you have the coming and going um, of the elected bodies and the, and the differences um, in the elected, um, the elected position sometimes, you know, um, it can take a while. Yeah, it can. And, and part of that reason is that there are, there are details that the advocate, we talked about advocacy versus statesmanship, uh, the advocate uh, wants to jump right to the conclusion. They want to say, I need more affordable housing, or I need uh, better transportation, or I need uh, left turn arrows. And uh, they want it to happen tomorrow. And often there's uh, engineering that has to go into that. There's finance that has to go into it. There is long-term uh, uh, notice that has to happen. And frankly, we talked earlier about making sure that everybody's voice is heard one of the problems or one of the aspects about making sure that everybody's voice is heard is it takes time to make sure that they have notice and that they have a chance to stand up and speak for or against, uh, depending on their preference. And then the council needs to make the hard decision. But getting those voices in is a time consuming process all by itself. And then also sometimes, you know, you go through that process, it ends up before council. And if there's not the the will, you have to turn around and repeat that process again because, you know, council kind of kicks it down the road because they weren't sure that everybody was heard, right? Mm -hmm. Because the vote might be going a certain way that some people are like, well, I wasn't hurt. It's like, no, you were heard. It's just that this is the direction. Um, you know, it's that... It's that sometimes people want really what it is that they want and they don't take no for an answer. Or no, they don't take different, you different put finger, You put your finger on one of the, 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 the big conundrums. You, you want to have a process, especially at the local level, that is as open and accessible as it can be. Because otherwise, citizens have no confidence in the decisions that are made if they feel they were frozen out from the beginning. And that was one of the things that I found was true of Phoenix when I was running for office, was people had just been left out. Uh, there had not been uh, the ability to contact the mayor or the council, and people knew it. And so the credibility of city decisions was highly suspect. Uh, and I think among most of our community, they basically said, oh yeah, the Phoenix 40, the the powers that be, they're going to get their way regardless of what I think. So there's no reason to be involved. So we tried to change that. And I think to a significant degree with the district system and other things we did, we were able to change it. But then as, as a new mayor, I had the second frustration, which we just talked about. That is, you also owe your constituency a decision. Yeah. You need to get finality. And so here are the two things that have to be weighed. One is make sure all the voices are heard. But the second one is make it very clear that at the end of the day, you're going to have a decision. Now, we had an example uh, that for years, Phoenix had fought over a homeless shelter. Uh, the idea was we should have one, but nobody had any concept as to where it should go. And every neighborhood was opposed, as I'm sure you know from your experience. Uh, it, it's it's the kind of thing that I think there's 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 consensus about until it has to be located in somebody's neighborhood, yeah. and then the consensus evaporates. And I did sort of the I, I was dedicated to the public process, but I tried to cut the that that terrible distinction between finality and openness. And what we did, we had a new council that came in. In 1984, I know this is ancient history, but I think perhaps sometimes history is illustrative. It repeats itself. And as the new mayor, I said, we're going we're gonna to listen to everybody. We're going to consider all the options, and we're going to make a decision by the end of January. And so that, that announcement was made three months before the decision was to be made. And, and I held the council's feet to the fire, and they did make a decision on a very controversial issue 
by actually the 31st of January. You know, they went to the very last day, but we got it done and we got the, the location cited and ended up being the first major city in Arizona to have a committed shelter for homeless people. And I'm very proud of that. I think it, 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 uh, it ended up with the right conclusion and it's still in existence today and it's run by a nonprofit. Um, but it took the combination of opening the door and getting their opinion and then also putting in a deadline. And I really think, you know, when I look at the concept of statesmanship, you know, Mayor Goddard, that to me is what statesmanship looks like. Um, it's really important what you said. It's, it's one thing to listen to all the information. You know, you get all the information from your constituency. You have all the professionals that have all the background information. You have all the dialogue at, at, at council. You read every email. A decision is owed to the public. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of times I see, you know, the decisions going round and round and round and round, right? You know, I'm thinking about a decision um, that council still has yet to make. You know, and I, I played a little part in it in that, you know, we had a constituent group say that they were going to pull a citizen's initiative if we allowed this one piece of property to be bundled with the rest, with these other two pieces of property for affordable housing RFP, right? So I was like, okay, rather than sticking in this RFP, have them pull a citizen's initiative, no developer's going to look at it. We're going to go ahead and remove it from this bundled RFP to give the citizens enough time to go out and do the work to get it on the citizens, to get it on the ballot, to pull a citizens initiative. You know, that was five years ago. You know, there was the opportunity for the citizens group to have turned it in at the last election. So this would be 2020. Um, and they chose not to. You know, currently right now, it doesn't look like there's any movement on that. And you're like, where's the finality then, right? So there's been this gap, you know, this piece of property was purchased for affordable housing. You know, there was this threat that you were going to put it on the ballot if anything happened, but kind of, you're not doing that. So I really think that, you know, a finality is owed to the citizens who purchased the property, who've invested in the property as to what this is going to, what's going to happen. And so I, I do think it's important, you know, there's that key. It's not just listening right? It's not just taking into account the totality of it and how it inter interconnects with other decisions, but it's also making the decision. Well, and I think if you look at the dissatisfaction with government uh, throughout the country today, it, it has, I think we've touched on both of the, of the fundamental uh, criticisms. One is nobody listens to me or people like me. And that's very strong. And I think that's had a, a prominent effect in some of the electoral decisions on a national level. Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, Congress, or you pick a branch of government, never does anything. They don't, they don't make a decision. So uh, it, it's a little bit of both. And I think where local government gets its stripes, and one of the reasons it's the most respected part of the governmental system in this country, is that it tries to do both. It tries to listen to the voices and it tries to at least make a decision to come down with something where you've got, and in your example of the affordable housing, unfortunately, I think people thought probably that when they bought the property for affordable housing, they'd made the decision. But unfortunately, governance isn't that simple. And it would have to go through the rest of the steps, including the challenge from opponents. You know, that's, that's part of the story. That's part of... Uh, it may be a lawsuit. It may be an initiative. It may be a referendum, as you described. Um, but you you work through those details, and that's why it takes so damn long. Uh, but that's all part of the process. And hopefully, leaders will do a better job of explaining, and followers will do a better job of understanding why the process is not instantaneous and shouldn't be. So where does empathy play a role in statesmanship or leadership? Or do you feel that empathy has a role in any of this? Oh, absolutely. Uh, empathy, being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes is critically important because you, 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 the, 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 the dictator I think we're seeing right now in, the, uh, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, 
you know, the dictator misses an awful lot because they only listen to what people who agree with them. And frankly, today with social media, I think we're all following into that trap where we tend to choose those avenues of expression that we agree with and that agree with us. Um, empathy means you almost have to seek out different points of view. Uh, I want to encourage my students. I teach a class in law school and, and uh, I've heard this said more and more across the country is a, a, a well-rounded student needs to seek out people that they believe they disagree with and find out why they're saying what they're saying. Why do they believe what they believe? And, and I think we all have a responsibility along those lines. Instead of just joining up with the folks we're comfortable with, uh, we're, we are going to be in increasingly hostile camps, unable to understand why anybody could have a different point of view. And uh, I, I just think that's the beginning of the end of our democratic system. If we can't understand, empathize with other points of view and be able to accommodate it in our, in our decision-making process. And that doesn't mean you have to count out every point of view. Obviously, that's impossible. You can't make a decision if, if you are, are spread out in every direction. You've got to be able to focus on a result. But that result can be tailored in many different ways. And I think that's where compromise comes into the equation, something that's become a dirty word in today's politics. But nonetheless, I think compromise means you've got a, you've got a good idea, one you believe in, but you're willing to say that maybe it could be better if we consider other people's points of view. I think that that, that is so critical. Um, and I thank you for speaking directly to that. You know, the idea of, um, of empathy and what that means. Um, and the fact that, you know, one of the reasons why when I did my doctoral research, I focused on mayors and vice mayors, because I think that mayors and vice mayors understand fundamentally the importance of having conversations with everyone, right? I will tell you that, um, and you know it from firsthand experience, as a mayor, you have to talk to everybody. You know, you get invited to many different functions and activities for resolutions or proclamations, stuff that you might not have even known existed beforehand, but you have to have, you have to talk to everybody. You know, you get to be mayor by making sure that you have relationships with at least 51% right? Um, it's, it's different than just being a council member and, and being able to, to be empathetic and to understand. And like you said, this concept of um, compromise, that now, you know, it's my way or the highway and nobody's interested in compromise. Um, and that makes it very hard. It, it does. I would say impossible to put together a governing coalition that uh, it gets things done. And one of the jobs of leadership is to figure out, okay, how do I get from A to B? Not just to solve the problem in front of you, but to do what's right for your community. And, and that means usually that nobody has an absolute perfect answer. Uh, and and I, I guess there's no, uh, there's no better example than that than a well-run city because you have to accommodate uh, a whole lot of different aspirations, desires, lifestyles, and, and it all makes up this wonderful hodgepodge or, or mosaic that we call Flagstaff or Phoenix or whatever city it is you care about. So our time is uh, getting ready to wrap up, um, but I wonder if you would just share with us, Mayor, and I love calling you Mayor, because <laughs> I know the last time we had a conversation about being a mayor and what it meant and everything we were doing, it was just one of those conversations I think went on like well over an hour. Um, um, what do you think about the concept of a statesman? And I use that word as a, um, as a multi-gendered word, um, right? I think that, you know, there are plenty of women who are statesmen. There are plenty of men who are statesmen. I think the problem is we don't have enough of them and that our focus tends to be bogged down on either the activist side of things or people who are really good politicians, but they're not exactly statesmen. Um, is this something that, is this a skill that can be learned, that can be taught? If there are people who are interested in, in really getting to the next step, you know, how do we get well-run cities and towns and communities 
you know, state representatives, governors, you know, presidents. How do you grow people into that? Well, it's a great question. I, I think that the, the short answer to what you just proposed is that I do think you can you can have certain attitudes which are helpful. Empathy you've mentioned is certainly one of the critical ones. Uh, uh, an ability to learn and, and a willingness to know that you don't know everything is is a critical attribute, I think, for leadership in the municipality. Uh, and the ability to respond to crisis, as you know, uh, you never can tell what the next day is going to bring. And it could be a fire. It could be a, a natural disaster. It could be a great opportunity for your community. And you probably haven't laid the groundwork as well as you would like to for each one of those challenges. So the ability to handle crisis is, uh, has got to be high on the list. Um, so how does a states person or statesman, I, I like the way you, uh, you clarify that it's not a gender specific term. Um, how do they grow into the role? I think nobody gets elected to any public office and they're instant fits. Uh, there's a lot they have to learn. There's a lot of humility that goes with any of these leadership positions, or you're not going to be successful. If you think you've already got the answers, I can assure you, you don't, um, because there are just too many aspects to a public policy position. So humility ought to be fairly high on the, on the list of, of states' uh, requirements. I think it's learned. I don't, I don't think anybody is born to a position like this. But I think the ability to learn, the ability to handle crisis, the ability to be broad-minded and to see things from other people's point of view are all attributes that go into being an effective statesman. Um, and uh, we need more of them, as you said. We need more people who are willing to take on one of the great challenges in life, one of the great opportunities to serve, uh, but to do it well, to do it to the most of your God-given abilities. And I think that is all we can ask. But when people, they cut the cards and only deal a couple and think that they're done, um, that's not what these jobs require. Yeah, you know, one of the things I was clear with telling people, I was like, I was elected by the people who elected me to be their mayor. I was also elected by those same people to be the mayor of the people who voted against me, as well as the people who couldn't vote for me, you know, people who are under the age of 18, undocumented, people have prison background records, you are elected to be the mayor of a city. And that means you have to represent everyone, whether or not you agree with their policies, you don't agree, you like it, you don't like it, you're their mayor. And it's very important that you act accordingly, right? Um, that potholes don't come with a party label, nor should they. And that's what I think is great about the position at the local level is that it's nonpartisan and it allows you to just get in and do the work that you need to do. Amen to that. It, 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 if you can make your city work for hopefully all of its citizens, but certainly as many citizens as possible, um, you've, you've accomplished a great deal. And, and I think that's what public service is all about. So thank you, Mayor. It's a great pleasure to talk to you about this and, and, and to, to relive some of the great challenges of one of the terrific public sector jobs in, in America, frankly, and that's to be a mayor. Well, I thank you for your time, Mayor Goddard. I also just want to also say Attorney General Goddard, because I know you were our Attorney General as well, but really this conversation focused on um, mayorship. So thank you very much for your time here tonight and for coming on the Mayor's Community Policy Trust. Thank you, Dr. Evans. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs>